Good evening, everyone. We'll get started here in about two minutes. So if you would like to speak today, please pick up a public comment card in the back, uh, provide it here to the front, our officer here, and we'll be able to allow you to participate during public comment and we'll be talking soon. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Expected to be going to work. All right. Good evening, everyone. Today is November 1st, 2022. It is 6 o'clock p.m. We are at 100 Polk Avenue in the city of Cape Canaveral, Florida. For our regular city council meeting, I call this meeting to order. Mayor Pro Tem, would you please lead us in the pledge? One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. City Clerk, please call the roll. Member Davis. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum. Here. Mayor Morrison. Here. Council Member Raymond. Council Member Willis. Here. Okay. Four out of the five are here. Councilmember Raymond was excused. I think she is not with us, obviously not with us today. So we have a quorum. We can proceed. This time, uh, take the quick opportunity for the approval of the agenda um, as written or with amendments. Council or city manager, are there any changes that we need to make structurally? We don't need to do anything. I don't. I think there we I think we can move right on. City attorney, we don't need to take a vote on if, if there is no. No action to rearrange the agenda. Um, as a matter of practice, if there are no changes, then no vote. I, I mean, I'm fine with that, too. Um, a lot of, lot of councils, though, do vote. On the approval of the agenda, whether or not. Okay. Whatever what do y'all want to do? Kind of new to us, so. Well, make it official. Yeah, take, a vote. take a vote. Okay, we'll we'll always try to vote. Looking for a motion. I make a motion to accept the agenda as written. I'll second. Got a motion by Council Member Willis. Got a second by Council Member Davis to approve the agenda as written. City Clerk. Davis. Four. Mayor Tim Kellum. Four. Mayor Morrison. Four. Councilmember Raymond. Councilmember Willis. Four. Motion passes 4-0.
This time we're gonna to go to the public participation portion of our meeting. We do have folks listening at home and or participating. And, and so uh, for those of you that filled out a card, if you have not, or you just arrived, please make sure that you fill out a card if you'd like to participate during the public participation portion of the meeting there in the back, provide it to our officer here. But I've already got a stack here going, so we'll get going through. Um, the first card that I have for public participation is Mark Bigby. While he's walking up, um, this light here in front of me, yellow light, a uh, green light means obviously go talk and uh, yellow is about 30 seconds left. And we ask that you please wrap it up before red. So thank you. Hey, Mark. Hi, uh, Mark Bigby, uh, North Cocoa Beach, also the owner here. Of the after attending the last meeting, I'm pretty disappointed in the entire vacational system based on what was said at that meeting and our experience over the last year. Mr. Baldwin from ProChamps was a little bit unprepared for that presentation, but a set of numbers he gave out stood out to me that I don't know that you guys caught. He said that he had found 425 Airbnb, 100 VRBO, and 50 Vacasa leases. That's almost 600 vacation rentals in this city, which y'all were claiming 304 with 188 registrations Y'all thought you had a 62% registration compliance. I believe it was Ms. Kellum even questioned why was it not higher, but with nearly 600 claims, that's like a 32% registration compliance. So you're only half of what you thought you were. The most disheartening part of the whole meeting was the seven day minimum discussion. This is decades old law with no basis or facts in anything. It's a huge strain on the city's code enforcement to attempt to track down one potential violator to get them to comply. The amount of time it takes code enforcement to investigate this is insane. In many cases, it also requires the neighbors to take pictures, keep logs, and then turn these over to the government to even try to track down whether this happened. And then also Mr. Palmer stated that he had reached out to some of the past guests to question how long they had stayed to get them to turn in their host. And that seems like it's gonna leave a bad taste. They came here and had a good time. And then the last thing they remember about their trip to Cape Canaveral is a code enforcement officer tracking them down to see how their trip was. They're not going to come back to Cape Canaveral after that. In the month of September, he said there were 15 total complaints regarding vacation rentals, but they were all just alleged violations of the seven day rule, not noise, not parking, not trash, just possible violations. And at any one time, you can pull up on your phone, there's 70 to 100 people right now advertising less than seven day minimum. Every day, my neighbors that I share a wall with on both sides of my condo are advertising two night minimums and they've been doing it since this registration went into effect a year ago and they can't be caught apparently according to mr palmer it's a very difficult thing um we're already competing with avon and cocoa beach for guests but now you're actually putting us in competition with our own neighbors um and it's very difficult to catch these guys it's near it's like enforcing a law that can't be enforced um and you won't fix this in a year from now if the conditions don't change you can't fix this in a year you're, you're forcing us legal operators to compete with people who aren't compete aren't uh acting legally it may not happen tonight but i hope that you come to realize that this outdated ordinance puts a huge strain on the city resources costs us both a lot of money and accomplishes nothing anybody that knows anything about the hotel and hospitality knows that 100 percent occupancy is not our goal that the sweet spot for maximum income is actually 70 to 80 percent occupancy but by forcing us to lower our prices to compete with Cocoa Beach, Cape Canaveral, I mean, uh, our own residents in Cape Canaveral that are not complex, not complying, um, you're actually increasing our occupancy. As your prices go down, occupancy goes up. So you're increasing the comings and goings, the traffic, everything that it seems like the seven day minimum is meant to restrict, you're actually increasing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, Mark. Mr. Steven Straub. Hello, Mr. Straub. Please introduce yourself and uh, address. Steven please. Stroud, I'm a resident of uh, 602 King Neptune Lane. I've been in Cape Canaveral for 17 plus years. I also sit on the PNC board for the city. Uh, I just wanted to tell the council, first off, and, uh, and mayor, I do appreciate y'all having the interest in having something done with A1, A1A other than a roundabout. I really do appreciate y'all taking the actions to uh, uh, get FDOT's attention with this situation. Uh, reason I'm up here is I wanna make sure that we are represented down on King Neptune Lane, uh, 
Sunset Court in Long Point, make sure we have some kind of representation. Uh, my concern is, and still and has always been, is preventing us from making a left-hand turn lane into our community there. And that's uh, something that I've had a concern with. I saw all the original maps, all the original layouts. I've seen no changes in that uh, and have, have seen nothing to prevent this from happening. And as I said before, What's gonna what's gonna transpire is, is if they take that left hand turn away from us, we're gonna end up going down the road, turning around on private property. People will be making a U turn in the middle of the road. That's just something I don't want to see happen. Uh, an underlying concern I do have is also our property values on that side of the street. I just want to make sure that we've got the right representation uh, when people get before F dot, try and get them to do something else with A one A. Do I agree with uh, all the ideas that they've come up with? Not necessarily, but I do want to see safety. Safety is a big concern. It would be nice to have bikeways. It would be nice to have uh, sidewalks. But honest to God, we're beach town. And this is a U.S. highway that's coming down through here. So we do have a lot of limitations on what we can do. But please, I just don't want to see us get boxed in on our streets over there. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Straub. All right, Mr. Bruce Robertson. Hello, Bruce. Please introduce yourself and address. Hello, I'm uh, Bruce Robertson. I'm out here on Washington. And I've spoken here before, and uh, I crossed that intersection of A1A in North Atlantic several times because my um, daughter used to cross it, my granddaughter, and we bring her across that intersection a lot, so I'm very familiar with it. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the council, and I'd like especially to thank uh, Mayor Morrison for his leadership in the uh, uh, resolution regarding killing the roundabout. I think uh, he, he acted, uh, and all the council members who voted for it, I believe it was unanimous, acted expeditiously in reflecting the wishes of the people of our city that we didn't want the roundabout, and we do appreciate it, uh, how quickly you went ahead and did it. Uh, I know there were some uh, who suggested that we wait one to three years uh, before we did further study on it, before we actually uh, let FDOT know how we felt about it. But uh, again, I, I want to thank you for going so quickly ahead with it. it I, I believe it truly reflects the feelings of uh, my friends and regarding not wanting the FDOT. Um, regarding the proper the two alternatives that were presented, again, I, I want to thank the mayor for posting the diagrams online so we could look at them, even though I had to blow up my computer to 300% so I could see it. Um, <clears throat> I'm a pedestrian, as I said before, I don't drive. So I'm looking at it from a pedestrian's perspective. And I was taking my niece over to Southern Charm uh, the other day for breakfast. And we were walking on the sidewalk as it currently exists. And uh, we were nearly run over by a very nice lady in an e-bike. And as you know, e-bikes uh, in the year 2026, when this is scheduled to happen, e-bikes and uh, golf carts are going to be all over our community. So I'm in favor of proposition uh, of uh, option one because it provides a separate bike lane, a separate bike lane where the e-bikes or the golf carts can go and the pedestrians, me with my granddaughter, can be safe on the other side of that sidewalk. Proposition two has beautiful traffic islands with oleanders that look really nice in CGI, and I know why they're there. Get rid of the suicide lanes and all the tipsy tourists coming from the Radisson across to get their Big Mac at nine o'clock and standing in the middle of the road. That's a big safety issue. But from a pedestrian point of view, with, with the proliferation of these motorized vehicles, if I'm hit by an e-bike or my uh, granddaughter is hit by an e-bike, it's just like getting hit by a car. So uh, that's why I'm for, uh, for alternative number one. That's the one with the separate lane for the pedestrians walking on the sidewalk and also for the uh, bicyclists or the motorized e-bikers. So we, we don't have uh, a conflict on the sidewalk in the year 2026. Uh, the other thing I would like to suggest is we haven't heard from uh, FDOT here. I'd like to see another presentation from FDOT with a CGI, with a model like they did for the roundabout at the Radisson so we can get a better idea of what our main street is going to look like in the year 2026. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Ms. Georgiana Gillette.
Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the Space Coast TPO, uh, 3815 Savannah Trail, Merritt Island. I just wanted to be here uh, to thank you for your leadership um, during the discussion of the A1A design improvements. I know that the conversations have been top uh, and that there is no way that you're going to um, satisfy everyone, but I just wanna say thank you very much. And I know that they, those have been very hard discussions. Um, and I wanna thank Todd, I know over the years we put in a lot of man hours uh, in trying to improve State Road A1A over the years. Our 19 member governing board includes Council Member Willis, um, and in July, he was in a position of defending why the State Road A1A improvement should remain at the top of our list of priority projects. And that's very important because there's very limited state and federal funding, and we have a lot of transportation needs, a lot of competing interests, not only in Brevard County, but in Central Florida. And, um, and so Council Member Willis represents you very well and, uh, and A1A remains at the top of the priority list. And that's a very important uh, step forward as we try to get the project fully funded. FDOT is our partners. You know, you might say we're the same coin, just different sides, um, you know, their state, uh, but we're made up of local governments. And so we have the local voice. And at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. Uh, we want a safe transportation system. We want to get to where we're going in a reasonable amount of time. And, you know, we want to accommodate all users. It really is about quality of life and what is going to improve Cape Canaveral, which is a, one of our most valued communities here in Brevard County. Uh, many of us were involved in the A1A Action Team of over 10 years ago, uh, and the goals really have not changed, not one bit. Um, the study identified strategies and they prioritized what sections of A1A would move forward and be implemented first. And that is the two A1A projects that are currently in design right now. Um, we acknowledge and respect the decision on the roundabout. Uh, you know, our citizens have a stake in it uh, and we appreciate your leadership on that. But to slow drivers down as they come flying off the beach line, uh, it really is going to require a sense of place and some countermeasures that's really gonna change driver behavior. Uh, and certainly both of the alternatives that's on the table is going to um, be improvements without a doubt. Um, but I do think uh, just our, our opinion is that uh, alternative two, certainly the boulevard improvements, which uh, involves the reconstruction of the roadway with a median, um, it would provide more countermeasures for the traffic calming and not to mention a pedestrian, pedestrian refuge. Uh, and again, we really appreciate your leadership uh, and thank you so much for what you do for Brevard County. Thank you, Georgina, for all that you do and the entire organization. And thank you, Council Member Willis for advocating for the number one or the top, one of the top spots and keeping it. We certainly need that representation and that's good to hear. Okay. Is Sarah Hodge? Yeah, Sarah Hodge and I kind of, there's parts of both options I like. <laughs> And some, you know, so it's hard because when we have a third option, <laughs> you know, one that, you know, we have the, the divided uh, pedestrian and uh, bike lane so that, because I nearly like I hit holding a sign for there last week. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like they don't stop at the corner. If there's, the light has shown the pedestrian has the right way, they go, so jump out of the way or you're going to get hit. But anyway, uh, there's so many near misses. People don't really know. <laughs> but um, so some type of, you know, no uh, turn on um, red if their light has been triggered by the person would be great, you know, but, it, yeah, but I, I like the idea of the divided medians, the ways medians. But then again, I don't like the people having to go half mile out of the way to make a new turn to get back to their businesses or their streets. So 
how do you balance that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I'm not the expert here to tell you how to do it, but I like the third option that we haven't gotten together yet. <laughs> and maybe we could take a poll of citizens to see, you know, how everyone feels about those two. You know, but thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you for all your time. Thank you. All right, Mr. William Hodge. Bill Hodge, Coral Drive, Cape Town. Uh, I'm not strong on either option, but I think I like option one the best, but the main reason I wanna speak is after standing over at the uh, intersection that we're talking about, North Atlantic and A1A, I cannot believe we haven't hit somebody there there must have been some accidents because what needs to happen, whatever whatever option you use, is when people push that walk light, all traffic needs to stop. Right now, people are turning right because they we, we can turn right on red. There's nothing that tells them not to. And of course, the people's got a walk sign, so they're walking, and here comes a car. And I've seen we saw a couple of three cases just in two and a half hours I was there. That it's amazing to me that people haven't been hit. But, so that's that's the main thing, whatever we do in that intersection. Is, and it should be at, also at Central Boulevard and A1A. When people push that walk sign, all traffic should stop. No right-hand turns. So it should be another light, sort of like they do around uh, State Road 3. If you're coming south on State Road 3, they have a big sign up there, no right turns at certain times. That's what they need to do. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. <laughs> I've stood at that intersection and it is bad. Thank you. Okay. Miss Marie Pierce. Hello, Miss Pierce. Marie Pierce, business owner of Beachside Car Wash at 8095 Astronaut Boulevard. Um, so we are definitely thankful that the roundabout has been taken off the table. Um, I'm looking at these designs and I'm hopeful that option one that mentions the turn lanes will still exist, will not, as someone previously spoke about for their residents, will not stop customers from being able to turn left into our property. Um, so we're looking for that support as one of the small business owners in your community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Dwayne Pierce. Hey, Mr. Pierce. Hi, thank you. Dwayne Pierce. I'm the manager at each side car wash. Uh, looking at your options, not giving us a turn lane will devastate part of our business. Uh, we hope you consider putting in a turn lane. Out of some of the drawings, I haven't seen where the median comes through any other section of the main road. Uh, it seems like, why does this one section have a median on it? And it'll uh, stop residents coming in on Long Point. So I do see the traffic. I probably spend quite a bit of time there during the week. I'm there every morning, usually from 6 to 8.30, 9 o'clock, and every two hours after that for an hour or two. I think part of it is uh, the driver's not being aware. We want to slow them down, put in more street lights, put in more pedestrian crossings. But I'm trying to figure out how this is reaching all the way over to Long Point when you have the one intersection that's creating all your problems. So please find an alternative way to allow traffic into our business and also the residents on the Long Point. So if they do have a, I don't, I see part of your drawing for the median, but if fire rescue or somebody else has to come in to Long Point, that means they have to go around and turn around. I mean, you're you're blocking up part of it. There has to be a better traffic flow system. So, 
if we look at other cities and see what they're doing for their pedestrian crossings, maybe we should take that into account. Because the way I keep hearing it is the speed on the main road. Well, there's other ways of decreasing the speed other than a median. And put in more crossings for people. I mean, I watch people cross over to Ace Hardware straight across the street. I watch them cross from Long Point. Maybe we need some other street designations to, or a street light that's on demand to slow down the traffic. Or maybe we need to decrease the traffic down to 35. And there's a lot of options that would uh, help some of us that are business owners along that main part of the road. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is all the cards I believe I have. If I missed you, please come forward and speak. But I think I got through them all. With that, we're going to now give the <clears throat> folks who are joining us here online. Okay, looks like I do not see, it is a long list here. Anyone's hands raised. If anyone would like to speak online, please raise your hand in case I did not say that earlier. I wanna make it clear that if you raise your hand, I will allow you to speak, I'll give it few more seconds, I still see no hands raised. And seeing none, I will say public comment. One last check is closed, no longer here. Have anyone who wants to participate and we'll close there as well, which moves us into items for action. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we are going to be taking up item number one, resolution number 2022-29. Uh, city attorney or city manager, if you'd like to maybe give a quick overview here, I think that would be very helpful. This is something from the last council meeting. At the end of the meeting, correct me if I'm wrong, we made a motion uh, to add it on to this uh, meeting today, which was originally a workshop. Um, so we we needed to take action quickly and Appreciate any overview for those listening in. And sure. Thank uh, you. Manager asked me to do this. Uh, <clears throat> resolution number 2022-29. Let me just read in the title because um, it's kind of self-explanatory in some respects. A resolution of the City Council of, of Cape Canaveral, Brevard County, Florida, providing for the swearing in of newly elected City Council members at the regular City Council meeting to be held in December of 2022, pursuant to section 2.02 subparagraph D of the city charter in consideration of the legal requirement to canvas all overseas ballots 10 days after the election and the supervisor of elections role in providing official election results to the city of Cape Canaveral for the November 8th, 2022 general election, which are expected to be issued on November 22nd, 2022, providing for the repeal of prior inconsistent Resolution, severability, and an effective date. The purpose of this resolution is to establish a swearing-in date um, for the city council. Under the city charter, the swearing-in date is at the next general election following, I mean, next general, re city next council. regular city council meeting after the general election. So in this particular case, under federal and state law, overseas ballots, um, anyone who requests an overseas ballot is per, um, is permitted to mail that ballot and it will be counted 10 days after the general election date of number eight so those ballots um, if there are any will not be counted until 10 days after the general election date so what that does is it pushes back the supervisor of election certification of election results um, to November 22nd, 2022. The City Council has historically held the swearing-in ceremony in November. However, the November regular, last regular meeting for the City Council uh, in November is prior to the date that the supervisor will certify final election results. 
So this resolution is proposing to schedule the swearing in date in December at either of your regular meeting uh, meetings in December, whatever the council chooses in order to afford an opportunity for the supervisor of elections and our canvassing board to issue certified election results. I believe as of as of Friday, I believe um, the supervisor of elections uh, advised the city clerk there were at least 56 overseas ballots um, that have been uh, requested and I think sent. I believe based on um, the information I received from 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 the city clerk, um, just as an FYI, and that re and the request for overseas ballots, I understand can happen right up until election day. Um, so it's, un we cannot predict how many overseas ballots will be issued, and we can't determine how many overseas ballots would actually be cast in this election. So I'd be happy to answer any, any questions mm -hmm. that the council may have regarding this resolution. Thank you very much. Want to add anything to that, Todd? No, no good. that's a good summary. Thank, Thank you. Anthony. Yeah. Council, any questions? Please. Um, we have a meeting on the 21st at 30. Right. Instead of waiting a whole month, we have to wait a month. Right. Good question. Um, section, but section 2.02, .02, subparagraph D of the city charter actually provides that any newly elected council member um, shall assume the duties of office next regular meeting of the city council following their election. And I, I think pursuant to city code and city council's policy, the regular meetings are the first and third um, um, Tuesday of each month. So having, you know, on November 29th or whatever, 28th, the date that you mentioned, would require the city council to actually call a special meeting, which, you know, technically doesn't comply with uh, the charter requirement that they, the council members assume office at the next regular meeting. So the regular meeting today is scheduled on November 15th. Why, if it's 10 days, at, if, if the election's on November 8th and we add 10 days, that takes us to November 18th. You said November 22nd. Is that business yeah. days? No. The, the 18th is 10 days after the general election. That's the date in which the overseas ballots, my understanding, will be opened and counted by the canvassing board. Okay. The official certification of results is several days after that, and and that's November 22nd, is my understanding. The supervisor of elections has advised our city clerk that the city of Cape Canaveral, as well as other local governments, will be receiving the official certified election results. So you got an instance where the counting of the overseas ballots and the delivery of the certified election results to the city of Cape Canaveral both occur after um, the second and final regular meeting of the council on November 15th. Okay. <clears throat> sure. What happens at the, at the 15th meeting? Um, and we have the council doesn't get a chance to not certified till the 22nd, so you're, you are elected, but you're really not elected. You would be unofficially. Well, yeah, it, you're would be considered regardless of who won a council member elect. Obviously, if an incumbent won, you would just be extending your term of office. Right. Um, so there would be would be no transition. Mm -hmm. So you would remain in office consecutively from your outgoing term and your new term. But if somebody new were to be elected. Um, uh, based on the certification of results, then they would be a council member elect until such time as um, they assume office, which according to the charter would be 
the next um, regular meeting of the council. Doesn't the uh, ordinances say that from time to time council may move the regular council meeting? Yeah, I'm just thinking through, we're, we're bound by this Tuesday, Thursday. And the other thing that comes to my mind <clears throat> is um, these are three-year terms. So if you extend the previous council member in, they're going to exceed the three-year term limit. Well, the full term, full term of office would be the date in which you assume office and the date in which you're sick. So... Um, but our ordinances it's are not charters count, it's three not a, years. Yeah, it, three years based on when you assume office and when your successor assumes office. Um, it's not based on calendar dates, so to speak. Um, so there would be an orderly transition. Um, as for your regular meetings, it, the, the city code 2-56 says city council shall hold regular meetings on the third Tuesday of each month at 6 p.m. Uh, and also you schedule a reserved city council regular meeting um, based on when you set your calendar at the beginning of the year. Um, and let's see. It will not be held regular meeting. It does say that the regular meetings may be otherwise postponed, canceled, or rescheduled by consensus of the city council. All in the place as designated by um, a majority of the council in an open session. It just seems silly to me that a council couldn't move their meeting. So with that, could we take the, could we go down the route that council member or Mayor Pro Tim Kellum had asked? This is a regular meeting. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, the, the section of the code that's applicable, it does say that regular meetings may otherwise be postponed, canceled, or rescheduled. So you, I guess your question is, could the council reschedule the regular meeting to a date after the certification um, in November? Based on, based on your... Um, ordinance, it appears that you could do that. That's not addressed. The regular meeting date is not addressed in the city. So it's an, it's an ordinance that's applicable in this case. Well, let's, let's, I'm going to let them, uh, the rest of the council that talk, but that. your yeah. questions have been answered so far. Mine have been answered, I believe. Um, Councilmember Willis or Davis, please. What? Well, we do have 12 6 reserved as a potential council date. What about the 29? Well, no, well, I think the first step is are you are we willing to do that? And then we can sort through the dates. I'm I'm perfectly willing. Um, I will have a scheduling issue of my own. So but me probably too, but we'll find, we'll figure. <clears throat> I would be more for the twelve six, just for issue scheduling and different things as well. Twelve six. I think that's what our next regular meeting was, the six and the. Okay, and so. What would happen to the November meeting? Who would sit in that meeting? Regular the newly council. elected? The current council would sit in the November meeting and we would have the 12 6. No, that I don't it, understand. You know, it, it depends on, it depends on um, if the council were to reschedule the regular meeting for purposes of swearing in new council members, then the new council whoever that is, the swearing in would be required to occur um, as a first order of business. So the, the new council would 
assume the duties at the next regular meeting. Well, and maybe my question was silly, but I guess the November 15th meeting, are we, we're saying we are going to move that to December 6th. We won't meet on November 15th. That's, as, that's what your question was, that's right? That's our question. Okay. I, or her, her suggestion and, is. And we're okay with not having the meeting on November 15th and postponing it until 12 6. Okay. I misunderstood you because I, I thought you were saying swear in December 6 and that's have the regular basically. meeting on in November. That's, that's what I thought you were saying. That's basically what okay. I was saying. That's what yes. I thought. That's my understanding. Just, we're calling the next scheduled meeting after the 15th on 12 6. Yeah, so we have our October, or our next meeting will, there will be no more meetings in November from so, here on out. No, we'd have the have November the 15th. 15th meeting. Unless it's rescheduled. But isn't this the meeting that we're talking about rescheduling yeah. to, we well, would not have it. We were suggesting not reschedule it, keep the November 15th and have the swearing in on December 6th, is my understanding. So the issue that we're trying to overcome is on November, we an election will have been completed. The voters would have sp spoken at that point. The certification comes in by November 22nd. We should try to meet, meet as close to a day after November 22nd as possible. And if 12-6 is the closest, well, 12-6 becomes that meeting. That's, I believe, we would not meet on the 15th at all because this is the reason to move the meeting is to avoid somebody making decisions who was not elected by the people in that meeting. 12-6, they'll be certified. I, I understand that. And I, I'm perfectly fine with, with that. With that. Okay. It, any other Questions or comments? No, I'm fine. Good. Sorry, I'm just looking okay. at my schedule. Sure. No, that's okay. Um, Council, I guess at this point, if unless our city attorney has any more information or anything, we just need a selected date. Um, take no action on this item. Is that what you would recommend? No action. No, I would recommend that. Oh, I put it in the blank. within this resolution. Yeah, I oh, think you need you need to either reschedule. If you, there's been discussion about rescheduling the November 15th um, city council regular city council meeting to mm -hmm. another date in November after the certification of election results, or the council can can conduct its November 15th regular city council meeting as this body is currently composed and schedule the swearing in in December. So we're basically just going to fill in the blank on this ordinance to December 6th. I think that's the that that's what's been presented. Um, just the next regular meeting after the certification of of um, of election results, based on your current calendar, is the two meetings in December. So you could pick one of those two regular meeting dates, insert it into the resolution, or as the deputy um, mayor indicated, um, you could reschedule the 15th regular meeting this month to another date in November after the certification of election results, in which case this resolution would be amended to reflect the rescheduled November meeting. Okay, so got, I just didn't think options. we needed a resolution to reschedule, but I understand and yeah. I think the, I think, I think the council should. Yeah, sh no, I did, that's fine. With the resolution, because it, 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 and it's a kind of a one-off situation here. It, 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 it's, it, it's, an issue. It. it's an issue as a result of changes in federal and, and state law and overseas ballots. This will not be the, the well, we can talk about this after the election. This likely will not be the, first time mm -hmm. um, that you would have to contend with this due to the um, what, rules that are very, uh, very relaxed. I mean, it, it impacts um, everyone 
on when those official result election results are actually final. Mm -hmm. It's many people will not realize, but it's it's more than 10 days after the general election, mm -hmm. just to make sure that overseas ballots are given there are counted and incorporated into the vote tallies. But if they know that 2000 ballots are out and even if one of the candidates got 100% of the votes, they wouldn't have enough to win the election. Mm -hmm. You'd think they'd be able to call that early. Well, they can project, right, based on unofficial, but- Because they know how official. many ballots are out. They have that. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, I hope but that's get, what they do. Yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll have an idea of, the pairs that the supervisor is counting the number of overseas ballots that are requested and issued but you'll never know until 10 days after the election how many overseas ballots are actually received mm -hmm. and then they're counted um, because there's 10 i mean they have 10 days in which to um you know receive those overseas ballots so i mean who can predict you know obviously an election is is voted upon by the people who can project the the margins on election day and whether or not overseas ballots will have any impact whatsoever on the election. Sometimes they may, sometimes they may not. And you can project that the margin uh, unofficial results are so large that they can't be overcome with overseas ballots, but other times you might be chopping on your nails for you know, a good 10, 10, 11, 12 days to see what the final count is. Thank you. I, I just, I think that um, we need to move the meeting to the 29th uh, because, you know, you're already, you're already, the election day is the 8th. You're asking the candidates, whoever wins or loses, to wait another month to, to take a seat or to um, resign their position or, um, so I think if, I'm going to make a motion that we move the uh, November 15th meeting to the 29th. That would be the first um, meeting. If we moved it, that would be the first uh, regular meeting after the certification check, which is what we. So your motion is to amend and by changing November 15th to 29th? Yes. Okay. Got a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Kellum to change from November 15th to November 29th. Mr. Mayor, on November 29th, I won't be able to attend remotely, but December 6th, I could. Okay, why don't you second the motion and then Bert. Okay. Angela's not here today. We haven't planned. Not that I want to discount the schedules, but I just well, think, I think, it, you know, I think the, the people that the candidates, the volunteers, the people that have worked hard for the last months and months, you know, I think that it would be better on the 29th to know where we're going to be. And um, but but at that meeting, we're going. To, the council will be making, uh, will be voting on who does what for the following year, mm -hmm. who is what, where, and I think you need total participation. True. Okay, so I got a motion to uh, change the date from November 15th to the 29th. I don't think, I don't hear any seconds. So I think that'll die for a lack of a second. If you wanna make another motion for another date, we can keep doing this till we find what works. Well, I think December 6th is just seven days further out. And I make a motion that we move our November 15th meeting to December 6th. I'll second. Got a motion by Council Member Willis, second by Council Member Davis to move the November 15th meeting to November 6th. Some discussion on that. Uh, Mayor Pertum Kellum, what is your concern with that? It's it's, it's too just long. So long. I mean, it's well, like, it's, um, well, it's, know, they've changed the 
laws to we have to wait to the certification now the 22nd and i just think you know for for the people that are voted and and want to seated it's a long time Can the, I say? the 15th is the date that we were going to meet mm -hmm. and so you know six days plus six day, that's 12 days later it's not a you, i just want to say it from December, it's not even a full two weeks. Yeah. From November eighth to December sixth is how many days? From November fifteenth, that's when they would be. That that's when the first meeting would be. When they you you'd calculate the difference from when they would have normally met in November, right, to mm -hmm. the proposed. Not from the date. I mean, no one the night of the election were not sworn and certified in. So there's always been a gap between now and that first meeting. May I seven days? Yes, I'm sorry. Seven. Well, they, if we sworn, if we got sworn in, or whoever got sworn in on the 15th, mm -hmm. that's seven days. But now we're going to swear whoever in on the 8th. which is 12 days. Six of us. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, it's 12 days. Yes, Councilmember Davis. Obviously, I understand the concern that you have. I mean, I am running as well, and I'm anxious to be seated or, or whatever, and, not, and know the results. But I also respect the position of Councilmember Willis, the fact that when we have that meeting, we are signing Mayor Pro Tem. We are signing people to represent the Florida League of Cities. We're, we're picking spots. So I think it's fair. That, I think, as much as I would like to know, I think that is important as well to have all staff here or all council here to do that voting. So I, I am for December 6th. As much as I want to know as well, <laughs> I'm for December 6th. But no, no council business will happen. Between the election and yeah. the 29th. Yeah. yeah. So what is one more week going to be now? Mm -hmm. okay. I think it'll be OK. All right. I mean, I just think that's a priority to have people here that would like I to be uh, represent the council in different positions. Agree. Okay. So I got uh, again the motion by Councilmember Willis, a second by Councilmember Davis to move the date from November 15th to December 6th. No more discussion, I don't think. Uh, city Manager. Just a clarification that will be a regular city council meeting, which means if there are other business items, they can also be on that agenda. Yes. Thank you. So that means we won't have the December 20th meeting. No, we, I think this wouldn't impact the December 20th meeting. Yeah. So we, there we still can, would be. We can make that determination in the December meeting and we can plan, but I, I think we would. I think the spirit was to meet at least 12 times a year. You know, you're keeping up with the city business, but yeah, it is an important one as we, we launch into the new fiscal year. So anything else? We'll call the question. We're good? Okay. City clerk, please call the roll. Member Davis? Four. Mayor Portem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council Member Raymond? Council Member Willis? Four. Motion passes 4-0. Moving on to the next item for discussion it is 6 51 p.m and we are on discuss and provide direction to the florida department of transportation f dot regarding design considerations for state road <clears throat> a1a so when we first um set this this meeting up we we wanted this to be a workshop and so that was certainly business that we just took care of but now can roll your sleeves up if we're going to have a workshop sort of quasi workshop the point is is um i know we heard some public comments but we're going to discuss up here and the, the difference that i see in a workshop in this is some public participation we might have some opportunities to go back and forth because when you talk you hear things that are said and you might feel the need to do that we might work through council and limit those second comments to maybe a minute a piece just to get um, through and give everyone a chance. But the most important thing in a workshop for me is that everyone's heard 
I know this council wants that as well. And so with that, I'd like to ask our city manager if you would like to give a, an overview for everyone. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, the, what we want to end up with tonight is we want to hear everybody's thoughts on the two options that are proposed. So the city council can, uh, at a later meeting date, make a formal um, response to FDOT. This is a critical decision that FDOT needs because it has to do with the width from curb to curb. They're different. I forget if it's 52 feet and 48 feet. Um, and Lexi's here, Mayor, and she can obviously, she's a staff representative to the TPO. Um, and Arlen is here, is Arlen here too? Yeah, he's here too. So we've got all the people here. Georgiana's here. Thank you, Georgiana, for being here. The width from curb to curb is what we're establishing with this decision. Tonight is about input. Council will make a formal uh, response at a future date to, to the FDOT. The width is informed by two choices. And it's been already talked about before tonight, so I'm not going to belabor it. I'll just summarize to say that there's an option that puts a median in the center, but it combines bike and ped to a nine foot area. So it's a median plus a combined nine foot area for bike and ped. That's one of the options. The other option is no median. We stay with what we've got in the middle, but we've got a separated bike lane and a separated pedestrian lane. So you kind of pick your poison here, right? And there, there's things we like about both, but they can't go in and out with this curb width throughout this corridor. So what, we, what we're determining as a result of this workshop is going to apply to the first project. Remember, the first project is the realignment of International Drive. The design for, re for that realignment will determine that roadway width from curb to curb. That will inform the future design that will go from there to George King Boulevard. That's why this is a critically important decision to make. Um, Lexi, did I leave anything off? Uh, that about covers kind of the general overview of it. Um, as Todd said, the widths are different from curb to curb. Alternative one is a 56 foot curb um, or a 56 foot width. So that is without the median. And then the second alternative is a 59.5 feet wide. That's with the median. Um, and that's just, there's different clearances required for different types of infrastructure, um, which is why you see that that difference in width. And then that ultimately affects um, the pedestrian slash bike space on the side of the road. And if we could also get the graphic pulled up on the computer, that the color graphic that shows the two options. Yeah, thank you. If you can blow up that one section in the middle there between, yeah. Okay, those, that's alternative one. Scroll up just a little bit so you get, oh, oh, there you go, one and two. So option one does not have the raised curb median, option two does. Option one has the separated bike and ped, option two has a combined bike and ped. Um, I would like to clarify that regardless of which option we go with, where we have the mid block crossings, this is where you push a button and the light turns red and you walk across. In those locations, and only those locations, in option one, you would have some raised curb medium. There's a grass island a little bit to the north and south as you walk across into that middle. You have some grass there. Um, and that's actually depicted, if you can scroll down just a little bit, Daniel. Right there, so you see how the grass is on the north and south of the crosswalk? That would happen if we went with alternative one. You would have that at the crosswalks, but only at the crosswalks. So I just wanted to point that out. And Mayor, we've already heard from several people tonight who expressed concern about access management for their particular businesses or their neighborhoods, um, about having to go and do a left-hand U-turn and come back around. Um, and there's concerns for that. Um, all things that need to be discussed and, and weighed and balanced in this meeting, Mayor. And I think that's about all I have to add. Thank you. Okay, good deal. Well, um, for those of you who joined us here who would like to pick up a um, packet, if there's, if you didn't get one there, I think we printed about 20 out front. Um, some of these printouts of this agenda packet. 
and if you need one, just let us know and, and maybe we can get you one printed. But as you're following along here, Council, I wanna really turn it over to y'all. We heard some public comments today. I do have an update from the community on my engagement and the experience I've had, but um, why don't we go, go around and um, whoever wants to go first. Well, Mr. Mayor, I've spoken to a number of people and exchanged quite a few emails, and they've run the gamut. We have some individuals, some of my neighbors even, that don't want anything done. They just want it left as it is. But, but we do need to do something to this road. This, as it is, it's dangerous. Um, but we also have many people who, uh, and we've had it expressed tonight, who like parts of both, but uh, this is FDOT's road and they, they are the engineers. We are the experts on what actually goes on day to day here. We see it, we see the people who are doing whatever. And <clears throat> so we know the impacts, but FDOT knows the geography and how it needs to, happen. But uh, having said that, uh, most of what I've encountered in discussions are either people want parts of it or they want option one. Um, I would like to, I would have preferred to have had FDOT here so they could tell us if there was an a la carte option. But I understand that uh, because of the engineering of it, that they, that's going to be difficult. Um, but there, there are opportunities to add additional lights, such as on therm. I would, I would like to be sure that we propose that, um, and give us a better idea of how many, uh, lighted crosswalks we could have, mid-block crossings. Um, but beyond that, <clears throat> I think we've, pretty much got to uh, continue to engage the community because I know there are probably quite a few others that would have liked to have uh, been here if uh, scheduling would have been different. But right now, I think uh, the majority of the people I've uh, spoken to prefer alternative one, although alternative two does present us with the uh, safest perceived street. Mr. Mayor? Yes, thank you. You don't? Mind. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, um, one of the things, I live on Columbia, so most of the people that I talked to said they don't even try to do a go left. They go right and then they make a, they go down to the light and come around. So the ones that I've talked to basically said the main priority is the speed. Everybody wants the speed down um, and that would help um, you know, that, that's been the priority we've heard for, for a while now. So what I've heard is alternative two. They would like the median. They understand that they're going to have to go down or turn around. I, to, I talked to F. Dot when um, back at the last time we met at City Hall, and I questioned him about U-turns and how safe U-turns were and how many accidents were related to U-turns. And they actually said that it's actually a safe, it's, it's not at hazard, that there are not any accidents, and it is a viable option. So the people that I talk to because of wanting to cut down on the speed are option or alternative two with the median. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Um, most people I talk to like the uh, number one option. And if you scroll down, um, Daniel, to the picture, um, down further there whoops um there's a medium right there with a crosswalk but that if you look down further it looks like there's another medium i don't know is it possible to have um places like that you know every so many feet where the turn lane would be open but there'd be like little islands of a tree or something and that way if people don't come to the walk the crosswalk at least there's a safe place for them. 
it across down. And that I see, I think if we did that every so many feet or however, it would give the turn lane for people turning left still. Um, people would be able to get to the car wash and the other businesses on the other side. And also if we put a medium there, a lot of people, a pe visitors especially, go to racetrack to fill up their gas tanks before they go to the airport or wherever. So that's gonna make people come out of there and go right and then try to find a place to turn around. Um, if we had those little mediums every so often and, and in the middle, it would be better um, for people trying to get out of there because where would they go out of racetrack to the next light and then have to figure out how to go turn around or would there be turn lanes in there? Um, mm -hmm. I like option one with maybe more mediums, leaving the turn lanes in the middle and the, the little islands every so often. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the the walkway and the bike lane is is really good because people, you know, riding their bikes and e-bikes, as someone said, you know, if they're in a separate lane, it wouldn't be so dangerous for people walking because they go fast. Um, and Everybody has one nowadays. So if we could separate the walkers from the bicycle people, I, I think that would be a good option. Um, and then I had a question. I don't know if, if you can answer this, um, Lexi, or down on where they chose the four-way stop and North Atlantic coming into the, the red line, this red line um, that goes in front of the businesses there, it says on the legend, it says that it will be a nine foot sidewalk. Will that sidewalk take up those parking parking places or is that just a line for? So where I'm right now, this phase of the project, um, which the project ID, uh, the two project IDs, both for the intersection and for this part of the corridor are, um, it's the same number, but one is, this one is called eight, the corridor, and then the other one's called five. Mm -hmm. um, eight, so the one that we're talking about tonight is still just in conceptual phases. So these renderings and this drawing are not necessarily to absolute scale. Uh, it's kind oh, of to I just gotcha. give an overview of it. Mm -hmm. So exact location of them is not yet determined because it is just in conceptual design. Um, it's just part of the process of engineering, right? It's 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 conception of project, conceptual design, and then we move on to design and, and engineering construction, things like that. Um, so there is some there is some right of way acquisition that is planned no matter what direction FDOT moves in with the city. Um, but it's, it would be hard to comment exactly on what specific impacts those would be at this time. Okay, and then the other, uh, the road that would be the four-way cross on the other side, Long Point, or uh, International, would that have bike paths and everything on it too? Sorry, wh where are you referencing exactly? Um, international, the new, how they would go through that lot and come out to the four-way stop. Would that road have pedestrian and bicycle path? I believe all of the all of the space that they're looking at impacting would either have that shared sidewalk or bike path separated from um, from from pedestrian space. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just I believe that um, option alternative one is um, the best thing for everybody, the residents that live on the other side of uh, A1A and the businesses, and uh, to make it safer. So, thank you. <clears throat> So yeah, uh, my thoughts are that not too far off. I mean, there was no overwhelming majority between all, alternative one or two. We got to hear a lot of details about the concerns and I, um, I, I think we heard some tonight and agreed with them, but I started about four days ago actively reaching out. And got, I counted up the emails, 133 emails. The citizens were awesome. They uh. I put together a summary, taking the hard work city staff put together and basically summarized, gave them um, access to these documents and asked them to please um, share 
which alternative you think is best and, and why. And uh, the I, I actually printed, um, I, I created a spreadsheet as I was going through and tracking all of them. And it, it was really cool to see, I have to share this with the council, but fine print. When I go down the line, every email detail, I, I wouldn't sit here and read them all and put us through that tonight, but in summary, alternative one out of the 133, 68 people, which made up about 52% of the people out of that group said they liked alternative one. Another 36%, 48 people, Cape Canaveral said that they liked alternative two. Um, and then there was another 12%, I guess, yeah, the remaining balance that said, hey, I don't care, do nothing. Uh, not I don't care, it was I, um, well, it wasn't fine with either. It was um, do nothing. Yeah, very, very specific. And so um, I think the, the fine with either would be assumed of a lot of people who didn't reply. So that was very good to see. Bikeable walk, bikers and walkers separation was important. That's obviously what makes alternative one. Um, that's one of the bigger differences. And so that seemed to be the major theme with with folks liking that one wheels a lot about e-bikes actually e-bike got its own column in my spreadsheet if they mentioned e-bike and several of people are concerned and it's not even e-bike it's just e-wheels wheel the devices will change over the years but we know when they're on we it's feet and wheels that are always competing for this space and the wheels are getting faster and the feet are trying to walk in peace i read a lot about um the wheels versus feet argument that hey i'm walking these e-bikes these e-scooters these one wheels are coming by fast some folks have their headphones on and got a really good email i'd actually like to read from one of the citizens that really summed up out of the, the ones i got it says hello mr mayor i prefer alternative one because of the separated bike lane i've lived here in cape canaveral since 1997 and I'm an avid bicyclist and frequent pedestrian. I've had the opportunity to experience the upgrades and improvements in additional pedways and sidewalks that have been implemented in our fine city over the years. I have found that sharing a pedway with pedestrian traffic is hazardous to all parties. Pedestrians resent sharing the walkway with bicyclists, and it's always doubtful if they will move over when I signal them in my intention to pass. Often they are wearing earbuds and don't hear me until I'm right upon them. They jump directly into my path. As a pedestrian, it's unnerving to have a bicycle whiz by me without warning. I'm grateful to, bicy to the bicycle friendly attitude here in Cape Canaveral and would love to see a dedicated separated bike lane the length of A1A to further improve the safety of all travelers. And so she said it in a, in a way that, that summarized a lot of those folks and they all had their differences, um, but, but overall alternative one was, was really the best based on the speed of the, the wheeled electronic devices. And also the continuous median um, was, was a concern. Those folks, the second big thing was they wanted to keep that middle lane open, whether it be someone's uh, neighborhood access getting blocked like we heard tonight or Long Point um, folks, and we heard tonight again, um, the fire department, uh, their ability to get to places quickly and utilize that fifth uh, middle lane, which we do see uh, us using. I think the so keeping the lanes open, separating them was was a big one. And alternative two, the reason people really liked alternative two, uh, landscaping was a big driver with that. And similar to the roundabout argument in traditional intersection was that it seemed to me that the folks who chose no, number two um, 
were not as adamant. I mean, they, they didn't seem as terrified with one. Now, that was my opinion, but one had a lot more. To, the comments on one was longer because they they did not want to, and it was um, a lot about about the landscaping, and then obviously the safe turning lanes and all the benefits that FDOT has put together for us here. We see that alternative two um, allows us to have. So with that, um, my, my hope is that we can. I would I would go with alternative one, um, but the landscaping that's shown on the five foot buffer from my conversations with FDOT and Jack and the team there, um, the height of the the shrubbery or tree or whatever was not uh, the big issue. It was the width and the diameter due to impact. So little shrubs crepe myrtles are kind of will obviously grow up um, but like the litty, little everglades palms when you come in with the big palms you only get the big beautiful palms when you get 35 miles an hour and the argument was well in order to get 35 you need the roundabout so today we're looking at 40 miles an hour this would be a decrease um, on a big section from what we have today so we are lowering the speed limit but i think if if we could get um, number one, an understanding of the landscaping in alternative one, can we go higher with, with some of the trees and, instead of having the low green foliage? And I think that would help balance out the folks who want, um, our vision talks about tree lined streets. We know that um, trees and, and, and shrubberies are traffic calming and beneficial for stormwater and all the other things. And so, one of my requests is that we we find out what is the maximum height um, of alternative one when we do that um, 12 foot medium, we keep that lane open. Um, another question that I have is trying to understand the turn lane the areas where people do not have to get in or out of their neighborhood. The, there's strips of land, and I think this is getting back to Mayor Pro Tem was saying, where medians would work and it would not block anyone. I didn't hear any a lot of opposition to that. I did hear some people say, keep the entire thing open. But if we could do alternative one and, and find opportunities where we have stretches of land where it would not impede anyone and put some medians in there with some trees so that we still get some of those benefits of alternative two, that would help us balance um, that out as well. And so that that would be another request that, that I'd like to, to see us try. Um, Had a few other things, but I think you know those are those are the big ones for now. I've got some notes. I'll go through it, but I want to see if there's anyone from the public who has any comments based on kind of that introductory. If you do, I would ask that we just keep it to to a minute, the best you can. We can do a quick round of comments if that's okay, Council, to try to keep the spirit of a workshop. To the we okay with that? Yes, sir. I just know Lexi had, is itching to say something too. Oh, please, yes. Um, just regarding the kind of uh, flexibility that you're kind of looking for in this design, um, part of the thing that we have to remember when we're looking at these alternatives is that this is only a mile stretch of road um, and traveling at 40 miles an hour, you travel that in about 90 seconds, just to kind of give a little bit of an anchor on exactly how much space we're working with. So when it does come to the medians, whether or not we implement them, it, it does kind of have to be rather consistent um, because it is very hard to slow traffic enough down to put islands in if we're not gonna have either an open middle lane or um, a median. So the, the in-between is a little bit harder to shoot for in terms of a, of a compromise. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not FDOT, you know, I'm not their team of engineers. It's just, 
there might be some some limitations, which is why we have to give them this direction to move in moving may forward. I, can, I, can I clarify yeah. just something? And, and yes, thank you. The strip, the vertical aerial of the road. Have you seen or have we seen where a vertical design showing where these medians will be? We have not this strip. We have not because this is still in just the concept design phase and FDOT can start to put that together once we give them direction. So it's they need to kind of understand what we're looking for for our sure. community before they can really dive deep into some of the more granular detailed parts of the design, including things like that. So yeah, just my it was actually my, one that my notes I said I would get to later is to request a design as soon as they can high level on generally where medians will go um certainly nothing to construction or to code but just to say generally here's what we where we could see the intersections and then where we can have a, a new signaled intersection like therm because it's really hard when we're looking down the road in these people like these designs on certain sections of the road and certain they don't and so if we go with an alternative, getting that as a next, is that a reasonable next step that they can show? It is. I, I'm not aware of their design process. They're, they're you know, back of house design. Um, projects like this take a whole team of engineers to design. So it, it could be a, a good chunk of time, but I, I can't speculate exactly on how quickly that could or could not be produced. No, I don't know that. I'm just saying, is that like the next step? We can find out, no rush, but mm -hmm. I'm hoping we do. Thank you so much, Councilmember Davis. I, I just have a quick question. I know 520 is not A1A, and I, I mean, I know there's a difference, but when they went in on 520, they put different medians in, you know, and then they put landscaping in, in different areas, different things. And I know it's a larger area than what we have. And in some areas, they have to do U-turns to get to businesses. So looking at 520 generally, what would you compare that to, one or two, as far as like the medians? And I know it's not, it's apples and oranges, but just trying to get a grasp, what would you say it's closer to? I honestly can't say. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just not aware exactly of what part of 520 you're, you're I'm just not as familiar with yeah. 520. Um, I, what I can comment on is that uh, the raised median practice is one that is used in a lot of communities that are like ours in Florida. Um, and generally speaking, the, the vehicular access management um, is regarded as like a really great tool to make communities safer for everybody. Okay. Um, and I understand, you know, there's pros and cons to both of the alternatives in front of us tonight. Um, but it, it, it does kind of create a more organized transportation thoroughfare for our community, which results in a, in a much safer space. Um, so you're so saying it, the medians look like alternate one? Alternative one, right? And the raised medians for alternate are what I'm referring to is the one for alternative two. It's just oh, a little bit more okay. of a managed access. Um, but I can't. It's pretty common practice in other communities. Um, I can't come. I'm just not as familiar with 520. Yeah, it's not I, not where I, this is about as far north as I go. Okay, yeah, they just have a little bit. It's of pretty cool to come here. So, um, right. so I'm just not as familiar with those with those types of medians. Do we have somebody who can, has fire weighed in on these two alternatives? Yes, and police, police have as well. Um, they've both gone on the record for saying they're not in the business of second guessing the engineers of FDOT. The engineers have given us two options. Yeah, they're, they're fine with either. They're fine with either, okay. Um, to comment just on, on crash numbers, raised medians do reduce crashes, vehicular to vehicular crashes, vehicular to pedestrian crashes, and so on and so forth, um, just across the board. So in terms of preservation of life, emergency responders would likely err on the side of wanting to wanting to have safer roadways mm -hmm. as well. And there, the, again, these are design, think, these are design concepts that are applied to a lot of different communities. Um, so they're able to navigate it just as efficiently as they are anything else. Is it unreasonable to think that we do alternative one or two and we still get 35 miles an hour? Because 
over time as the traffic and as economic development begins and people start building their buildings closer to the road, maybe not as close as City Hall went, but closer. That's um it's, that's outside of that's honestly outside of my wheelhouse. I'm not entirely aware of all of the details that go into reducing speed. There's a lot of different considerations when it comes to how a roadway speed is reduced. That includes geometry, traffic volume, zoning, closeness to the road, you know, all of those things. Um so I couldn't I couldn't speculate down the line what that might look like. I know right now our, our bottom limit is that 40, as FDOT has told us. Um but as for speaking to 35, I'm really not sure. Yeah, and I've, had, I've talked to them about it. I was just curious to know um, if that was unreasonable to think. So thank you. I, um, I think we, we're hearing a lot about one. Um, anything else you wanna discuss? Mr. Mayor, we do have to consider that what we're doing or deciding on here it's replicated south of City Hall as we head towards Cocoa Beach. Mm -hmm. So it's we have to consider all of Cape right. Canaveral, not just this one intersection and to the north. But you know, as talking with Lexi earlier, she mentioned to me that uh, traffic counts don't just relate to cars. So having those sidewalks and tracks impacts our traffic count, if you will, with the pedestrians, the motor, the bicycle traffic. So we have to weigh all of those factors with this. Wait, say that again. You're saying that traffic counts are not just cars. Sure. So we we look at the the cycle traffic or the mm -hmm. e-bikes, et cetera, and the sidewalk and how those are impacted because we did Here's some comments about your email that uh, the lady was very nervous about uh, riding her bike near pedestrians. So, mm -hmm. you know, having that option of the two lanes for uh, the pedways, I think, is critical. Which we're getting in one. Yes. Right. I agree. In the end, it's going to be really hard. I think the citizens, if we could request a preliminary design at the next meeting, back of the napkin, just generally where these medians are going to be, the citizens would love to review that because that that determines, I think, a lot. Um, and it focuses on the south and the north side, but and, and trying to press up on the landscaping um, and not go so so small and just practically thinking who will, I assume FDOT will be responsible to maintain the landscaping um, or is that gonna be on us? We have folks from Public Works here tonight that can answer that question about how the landscaping is, it, is maintained. Yes, thank you. And your opinion on landscaping and these alternatives from that perspective would be helpful. Hey, Jim. Hey, good afternoon, Council. Council. Yeah, that would be done by Public Works, and we would just add it to U.S. Lons' annual contract to maintain it. My request is that uh, less grass is better. I don't understand when I see a median, and I'm willing to understand, it'll be this long strip of grass that wide. No, no, they just hit it with the, but, it'll be isolated on an island and I'm going, man, if we could do, you see some other things that no one would have to walk all the way over there and zip that. And so my my hope is that we can implement drought tolerant, Florida friendly, great for storm water, easy to take care of, no, no uh, obviously pruning maintenance, that our team will do the pruning and the shrubs and the, just like we do on Ridgewood, Yes, sir. When they keep in mind, the strip of sod that you're talking about is there for erosion control. That's what keeps the mulch or rock or whatever inside the islands. But then there's some low growing, a replacement, something with some roots that can hold that soil. Um, some there's, lower growing greenery. There is, but DOT likes the sod as far as up 
next to the curb. Okay. And that protects it from erosion from the curb breaking back or washing into the road. That's that's her main concern. Okay. So from a maintenance perspective, this road does one of them look more uh when I look at it, if I gotta go and get out in the middle of the road on A1A, that's not the safest environment for Absolutely you guys not. to be. So, and that would be new for us. There's there are no medians on A1A in Cape Canaveral that we're taking care of. No. That one on Central that we just did, but Correct. two different roads. Yeah. Okay. Two different traffic counts. Mm hmm And uh, I I would even recommend you could do paved islands. I mean that's that's an option too. So. And that's what I think we've seen that on 520. Yeah, it's on 520. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Well, we can dig into that as this plan kind of unfolds. This is conceptual, but thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Sound, I mean, fire and police are okay with either infrastructure maintenance is going to take care of it. And um, so low cost, uh, stormwater friendly, aesthetically beautiful sounds uh like number one is is the one we're all leaning towards um as far as f dot's deadline my last conversation was the sooner the better and they they the funding i have not heard any comments on we were seeing a decrease in funding or anything there were some comments that were made about, um, well, this is now a watered down project. I would say it is going to more than likely be lower cost because the roundabout was just naturally more expensive. But I am not aware of anything that's going to be compromised on this. Um, FDOT has been fantastic. And, and I just want to make that clear that um, we're going to build the safest, best road we possibly can for this community. And I'm very thankful for uh, our city staff trying to, to work through this and get this information over to us. It is back to the 2018 survey. I've said this time and time again, that's the most credible survey. If not, I, th I still think it is that we did because we had an overwhelming response um, large number and A1A was the most, the top concern in there. And the old, you know, it's not our road, we can't do anything. It's so exciting to be here uh, with a construction start date, probably 2026, 27 fiscal year. Give and or take, yeah. Maybe, maybe a year after. Four months yeah. to finish the project. Mm -hmm. So if it starts in 27, say, it's over in yeah, 29. So before 2030, just to, to let you guys know how early this starts. And, and I say that to say this, if we can see at the next meeting an aerial, would an aerial change my mind on this? I don't know. And maybe I just need to, to talk with FDOT and see, but having FDOT here, like we said, if we can get them at the next that December meeting or January meeting before they just launch into action, um, that would help. Or we just go forward with alternative one as is. But I think those special requests we have to work with them. If if they can wait, our risk in waiting is we would lose out on funding. But we have, I think, the ability to. With the 2027 construction start date to come back together with FDOT in January, or are we recommending, you no, know, we should we should go forward and and let them run. They've been accommodating, very accommodating so far. Georgiana, thank you for all your help. You've been instrumental in that too. Wouldn't you agree that um, if this council asked for FDOT to come back for some Q and A on this topic, say in December or January, they'd be willing to help us out there. I'm, and I'm just trying to address some of the concerns I heard earlier from about FDOT's presence, your presence. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, one of the things, Todd, that um, I know DOT has mentioned to me that uh, 
due to the fact that the TPO put some federal funding on the intersection project, it's been sitting there a while. And they seem to have some concerns that they wanted to kind of get moving. Um, so the intersection is fully funded for construction, but of course the Boulevard project is not. And so they're waiting to understand, okay, what is that typical section gonna look like? What does the city want for the, for the Boulevard project so they can move forward with the intersection all the way to Long Point. So they did express that concern with me. Uh, mm -hmm. for what it's That's worth. helpful. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Federal Highway, you know, when, uh, when, a, when federal funding sits on a project and it's not moving along, the department has to explain why there's strings attached. And of course we're 100% federally funded. So it's just kind of what we're used to. So it was just something that the department was was a little concerned about, that's all. Not to say that it couldn't be worked through. If I may, I, I something came to my mind that I just wanted to mention. Um, E-bikes and bicycles can still be on the sidewalk, even with a cycle track, per state law. Of course, the city could adopt an ordinance prohibiting that because I've been to big cities and I've seen cycle tracks and boy, those bicycles are flying. Uh, me, I may not want to get in the cycle track with, you know, tooling along on a, on a beach bicycle. So it's just something I, I thought I would uh, put a bug in your ear that it's, it's not a given. You still may have that mixture of the folks that want to tool around on a bicycle very slowly and be, in a, be on a sidewalk because they don't feel comfortable being in the fast cycle track lane. So just wanted to put that uh, bug in your ear. And Lexi, I very much agree with all everything that you said uh, from an engineering standpoint. Um, uh, you know, they're the engineers, but at the end of the day, it, it's we support what, what council wants. Thank you, Georgina, I appreciate it. So, okay. I. I I do not want to slow this this project down. I want to keep moving towards safety as fast as possible. Council, what do y'all want to do? I think here's what I can commit to. We move forward and I expeditiously meet with whoever we need to to continue to let them know. We're, here, here's a summary of, of the meeting minutes. They're going to watch the, the meeting or summarize it and I can continue to advocate for what this council wants. So if we walk away with a list today, well, I will I, champion it. I would be all for putting a list together, but we did have some more citizens that wanted to speak further yes. on it. So I'd Can, like to hear what they had. To say. Yes, I do want to open that up. Can we take a break for 10 minutes? That will allow me to actually talk to a couple of you and I need to use the restroom and then we can come back and reconvene. I encourage you to talk to council members and staff too. This is kind of like a workshop. It'll allow us to break briefly here. So it's 7.35, council will reconvene at 7.45. Thank you.
All right, everyone, we're going to give it about another minute. We're over. We're going to get started here. Okay, thank you all for your your patience there. Took a recess. All right, so go ahead and call the meeting back to order. And uh, we're right in the middle of uh, just finished up our comments. I think we want to go to the public now. You got to hear some of the council. So the way I think we can do this, council, if there's anything you disagree with, is try to let's work like good neighbors and be respectful of each other and try kind of first come, first serve. If that gets out of hand, we'll implement another one. So. Maybe in this front row, does anyone want to speak? Yes, Ms. Michelle, please go ahead. We're going to try to keep it to a minute if we can. And, and if there's more time at the end, we don't mind going back through. We just want to ensure everyone gets a chance to talk. So go ahead. You'll need to speak into the microphone, Ms. Michelle. You'll... I'd rather not if you can hear me without it. Well, there's folks. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Joe. Michelle Church, I live at 210 Long Point Road. And yes, I'm concerned. And I would like to see us keep exactly what we've got because it's working with the turn lane down the center without it being raised and without having separate median. So I'm interested in alternate number one, but I'm more interested in the fact that this project should be encompassing the entire length of A1A from beginning to end in the city of Cape Canaveral so that we are not piece milling this along the way. And I realize that this project that y'all are discussing is just for a small little area. And that's the part that really concerns me because that small little area is right where I live. As far as having plants in the medians, et cetera, more than just for the crosswalks, I think that that's a ridiculous situation because we don't take care very well of what we've already got in the city. We have sidewalks that have cracks in them. We have streets with potholes. We have parks that are not being maintained, Thank et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Michelle. If we got more time at the end, we'll make sure to get back to you. Okay, anyone else on the front row? Please, thank you. Please say your name and... Hello, Mary Gowan, 211 and 213 Long Point. Thank you. Um, it seems to be a choice between, do you want a turning lane or do you want a median? I don't want any more medians, no medians. Look at downtown Cocoa Beach. The A1A goes right into Minuteman. They are so sorry that they made that big mess there with all those stupid mediums and people are running. You can't even, it, it's just a terrible mess. And I know all of you have probably been there. We certainly don't want to have that situation going on here. And as far as landscaping goes, well, you know, if you go west on 520, which I do often, I mean, the lands, I just don't think we need any more landscaping. If we're going to have the, if we have to have the medians, I don't think they should be landscaped. They should have brick pavers so you can see over them or around them or something. Thank you very much. Yes, Miss Green. Thank you. For, thank you for having us, number one. Number two, thank you for listening. Um, I echo what they said. I live on Long Point Road. And um, getting in and out of Long Point Road right now is no problem. But put a medium there, and I I really object to any kind of medium going up and going going around and come back down. We just had one of our neighbors had had an emergency, and thank God they got to him in time. What because he he it was time a very time thing and to get him out of his house and get him. And if they had had to fight a medium to get down Long Point Road to get to my neighbor, he probably would not be with us today. So I object to the medium. I do, and I don't, I object to any more trees down the middle of a highway. I agree with what she said. And that's me. I, that's, I, Thank you, Ms. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, Joe. Joe Avery, Long Point Road. Um, you've heard all of them. And I've also heard a couple of times from the council about a traffic light at Thurm. 
I don't know why I would go to Therm. I'm thinking Columbia would be more logical. Therm is a three-way intersection. Columbia is a four-way intersection. Columbia is halfway between Therm and International Drive. That seems logical to me to put it there. If we do go with option one, there's an issue and, and it's something we run into coming off of Long Point Road. If I wanna make a left, I have a lot of people coming off of Columbia, coming down to make a U-turn. I'm trying to get into that middle lane, they're coming. And it has happened quite a bit. I'm sure Ms. Davis has run into that. So, and again, I know it's not the council, it's gonna be the FDOT engineers. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else on the first row to speak? Second row, just behind them? Uh, Mike Corgan. Hey, Mike. I'm uh, kind of new to Florida. I've been in Cape Canaveral for uh, five years now, and I really, really love it here. But uh, this A1A is a commercial corridor. We've got businesses all over the place. Uh, it should be kept that. It's not residential. They have a lot of delivery trucks. They you put in a median, uh, they're going to have to be making U-turns and clogging up, clogging up the intersections. Um, the We need some crosswalks. I have three friends, three neighbors killed right out here. One was hit by a car doing 70 miles an hour. You can lower the, you can lower the speed limit down to 10. People aren't going to buy the abide by it. It's not going to happen. There are ways to visually reduce the speed limit. Highways that are elevated, people drive fire faster. Ones that are re, are lower, they don't drive as fast. You put in some crosswalks, and you put in crosswalks that the drivers can see and are alerted to but are not distracted by with the strobe lights, you may have some success. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else in that second row? Michael was third row just behind. Anyone? Hey, Bruce. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, I just want to echo what this gentleman said here. Uh, the reason I'm really against uh, proposition alternative number two is we don't want to build a one mile long Berlin Wall down the middle of a commercial road with business on each side, even if it has hibiscuses on it to make it look really nice, okay? We don't want to have a situation where delivery trucks who are going to our businesses have to make U-turns. A council member said that U-turns are great. The FDOT encourages U-turns. I have three traffic officers in my family. None of them would say that a road designed to encourage U-turns makes it safer. None of them. So that's, again, why I oppose uh, alternative number two with the median. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on Bruce's row? Okay, so you know on the row behind that, anyone? Row behind that, moving over to the right side of the room, anyone on this entire side? Yep. In the spirit of workshop, a couple thoughts to share based on some comments that were earlier made. Um, the first is multiple medians going all the way up, kind of you're between one and two. I would just ask you to consider that there's a lot of bigger trucks and trucks and trailers and trucks and jet skis. And I don't want to impede and start putting people out where they can't get into a turn lane. That's what I was most worried about, even with the long median all the way down. A little tiny turn lane for some new turns. I said, I couldn't imagine it would ever be enough. The second, as a driver, I feel more anxious making a U-turn than I do just crossing the two lanes. Again, just thoughts. But if I have to make that U-turn and speed into the traffic, I think it's, for me, it's more anxious. Um, and if you have a larger truck, you can't make a U-turn. I can't turn my husband's truck. I can turn my Jeep, but I can't get that truck to make a U-turn without finding myself at multiple points. And then the last, as a potential recipient of police or fire service, I think that median, maybe they don't want to weigh in. That sounds to me like it would delay service. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Arlen, thank you. Arlen Niblau, 8931 Lake Drive. Uh, I am for uh, option number two. 
Uh, I think the divided roads, uh, you were talking before about 520, go down near Walmart in that area there where they did do the same thing with the dividing and the left turn and you make the U-turns, there is plenty of room to do it and it's so much safer. It's saving lives and a lot less accidents than it used to be with people coming and going there. Uh, I just don't think that, that, you know, we can sit down. All of this is going to take many years, like we said. It might be 20, 30 or later before this actually gets completed, even the first phase. But remember, we got to think about safety and we need to be sure the red lights that we're going to have are going to be so much better than the ones down in Cocoa Beach and South where they have the flashing yellow lights. Coming back on my bicycle from Patrick the other morning, there was a young lady, she was there. She pushed the button and she started to go and three cars came shooting through there. Mm -hmm. And you know, these electric vehicles don't need to be on the, on the sidewalks, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'm looking online. If anyone is online that would like to speak, please raise your hand. I will recognize it and unmute you. Going down the list, thank you for hanging on and listening with us, all of you from home tonight. I do not see any hands raised. We'll check in. Okay. With that, we'll bring it back to the council. Yes, Councilmember Davis. I'd just like to clarify something. It was stated that I said that U-turns were safe in that. What I stated was that I was concerned about U-turns. I questioned FDOT about U-turns and how safe they were. So it's not something that I'm saying they were safe. I'm saying FDOT assured me that there were no issues with the U-turns and that they are done safely and they're not causing crashes. So to get it clear, I questioned FDOT and that's what FDOT told me, just to verification. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, I, I, you know, I still think that uh, option number one is is the best choice. And we, you know, we talk about being a walkable, bikeable city, and to have the separation of the bicycle and the walkway is is something that is, you know, forward thinking, and and um, you know, it adds to what we say we are and what we are doing to be that. So I like. One. Thank you. That's member Willis. Uh, yes. Um, if we're if we're going to make a list of desired items to ask of FDOT, I would like to clearly understand from them the impacts on the side streets and stop signs. How far back are uh, this was brought up during the break by uh, uh, Jim Moore. Um, the For option one, he was saying that the stop signs would be so far back from the entrance into the roadway from a side street. I want to be sure where those are, what kind of blind spots there might be, how much setback are they before they enter or try to enter into the uh, onto A1A, things like that. There, there may be other concerns from these side streets that we're not understanding or don't see from the information we've been given. Got it. How far back the stop signs are from anyone entering onto A1A from a side street? Right. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you want to see it if it, like a 3D rendering, you yeah. which we've heard. If you were at that coming out of that street, obeying the law, you know, behind the the white line stop sign, you want to see that view. It would it would be very helpful to see if there's any appreciable difference between option one and option two on those side streets. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Because if in option two, you have the nine foot sidewalk, well, that enters differently than the other headway and bike lane possible. I wanna be sure where those stop signs are going to be. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe we have an answer right here. Mayor Lexi has a comment on that. Oh, yes, please. Okay. Um, so what you're referring to, the strategies used to ensure line of sight, um, and a lot of when it comes to pedestrians or seeing around a corner is often referred to as daylighting. Um, so just kind of opening up that vision, that area where there, where there is more uh, propensity for blindness, that is part of FDOT's assessment as well. Um, when it comes to pedestrian and or bike and or shared spaces, crossing driveways, crossing uh, side streets, so daylighting, that, that strategy, that, that, that assessment, and then the consequential strategies to ensure proper vision is part of their assessment as well. So that's, that's just typically called daylighting. There's a few terms. Daylighting is used in a few different ways. In this propensity, it's used, it's referring to just opening up that vision um, so that people can, pedestrians, bikers, sidewalk users can see and, and make eye contact with drivers and vice versa. Good. The um, attachment to design, this is just a preliminary design, if I understand. Um, what is the next, are, are we making any decisions on, I mean, this? So this is a conceptual design for mm -hmm. the signalized intersection, mm -hmm. um, which is different from a preliminary design. A conceptual design is really just the closest thing to back of the envelope that we can get when it comes to these types of projects. Preliminary design is like a percentage completed design. So 10, 20, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, so next steps are going to include, you know, once, once we have an idea of what the rest of the corridor needs to look like, right, our, our stretch of road or boulevard, as Georgiana called it, um, we'll be able to understand more wholly because it is a systemic Right, traffic and transportation needs to be approached in a systemic manner. You know, it's like water in a pipe, cars on a road, they, they behave somewhat simil similarly. Um, it needs to be approached kind of systemically. So understanding what the corridor looks like, what the pipe looks like is gonna tell us what, what this intersection or, or you know, this, this input looks like. Um, so the next steps are going to be marching through design or NAVDOT's gonna, you know, they're gonna get their direction from us. Got it, thank you so much. So yes, I'll come come right back to you. This median in the design that we're looking at here, this would be option two. This is alternative two when we're looking down airily, right? Because that wouldn't be there if it was alternative one. I can't confirm that. Um, I, I think for the sake of the of the rendering of the concept that they're trying to put here is because, so there, this this looks a little bit different, right? Because there's controlled turns at an intersection, which mm -hmm. is a separate type of traffic control strategy than just simply um, a, a dual direction turn lane or putting in a median. So this, this could just be part of the traffic calming measures that could be implemented in either option. Because I did not design this, I can't speak to it definitively. Um, however, this application is common even on roadways that have an open middle section as well. There's usually an introduction of a median when you're approaching an intersection because naturally you have to slow down as you approach an intersection because there's a lot of other stuff going on. So it's used as a traffic calming measure, even if it's not whole, wholly applied during the entire length of the project that we're discussing today. So. Really, I can't say what this is meant to the, represent because it's the just the description meant, itself at the bottom says with with median. With me, yeah, and it, yeah. but it could just be referring to that portion of the of the the, yeah, the image. So I just I I can't speak definitively if it's meant to show this is what it will look like only if you choose alternative one versus this is what it will look like only if you choose choose alternative two. So this doesn't, we don't know if this represents either or or both. To, to me, it looks like it's got the median. It says a 12 to 15 and a half foot wide median right there at the bottom of it. So this would be an aerial. I, I'm going to assume that this is an aerial of alternative two. 
I, I would of, say it yeah. looks more like that than one. Yeah. Yeah. There may still be, because of the approach to an intersection, there right. may still be a some form of median approaching that intersection as a traffic calming and control measure. So it is still possible with alternative one for it to look something like this. And that that's where where I was a little stuck earlier trying to say it's hard to make this decision without looking down because I what does alternative one look from an aerial perspective? That's what keep moving forward, but whatever we, we choose, I want to see as soon as possible an aerial. And if if we could, if this is two, I haven't, there, there actually are those, um, I mean, right there, we stood there, Lexi, they've got the, the pipes coming up down the middle of the road there. And so, the if the request is if they do a median it does not block off these two there and I, I know that would shorten it but that that would be my my request is start the median as far south as you can without impeding or blocking anyone's ability to get in um it functions today without one and i mean i don't know other than those pipes um i just want to be clear on what we're what we're selecting and if alternative one is just remove the median um it sounds like we don't really know yet where these are going to be proposed on, on a survey or on a map right uh, so when we select these views alternative one or two we can assume where there's a signaled intersection under the alternative one image, it's gonna look something like that. And so can we pull up, so right here, what I'm saying, can we pull up the alternative one image down at the bottom left in the red box? Yeah, so um, it's a little hard to imagine, but imagine this would be this median coming out uh, would, would be fine. At, at that intersection, because that only comes out, I don't know, 25 feet. And so that wouldn't block Long Point Road. Essentially what's being proposed in alternative one is that anywhere that there are mid block crossings, there will be medians. Otherwise, A1A will look very similar to what it looks like today. So there might there may be one or two more crossings, okay. like like dedicated crossings for pedestrians. When it comes to alternative two, uh, Daniel, if you can just scoot on over. It will look a little, it'll look more like this. That's not to say that it'll be a continuous one mile long stretch of median. There will be access management in terms of, you know, controlled U-turns to organize transportation, to organize traffic as it goes down the road. Um, but it'll, there will still be the other option will have some form of raised island. This one will have more of a stretch. So when we're approaching intersections, one of the calming measures that is often used, even if there's not a continuous median, is to put in a center island, something to just kind of tell people, uh, you know, slow down. You can't use this to turn because it's approaching a, a protected left-hand turn, right? As we saw kind of in the in the rendering with the aerial. Um, so it's just it's just to to compare these images to an intersection is not 100% accurate. Um, but if you were to kind of imagine, even if we were to go with alternative one, this intersection being a four-way intersection, it might look something like this if it makes sense to implement that traffic calming measure at that intersection, even without a mile of more continuous median behind it, if that makes sense. The 3D rendering they did for the roundabout, will they do a 3D rendering for this? I'm sure they they might. I there is a lot of work that goes into those renderings. Um, there is some design that has to be completed to complete those renderings. So I think at this point they're looking for more direction. It I we could ask, um, but they also have you know they have timelines and schedules as well uh, and consultants and engineers to work with. So I'm I'm it's just we can ask and see if they can provide that to us. 
if they believe alternative two is the best, which I think they do, and we're hearing all alternative one up here, my hope is that a 3D rendering might help me see it the way they see it. But if they're, if that's not, doesn't make sense, I understand that yeah. 100%. I guess um, to clarify, I just, I just can't, I can't guarantee that they would be able to provide that no, I'm not, very, very I'm, soon. Of course, yeah. I'm not asking you to guarantee yeah. anything FDOT is going to do. Um, they're a separate agency. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to talk through what an ideal next step looks like. And if we, if we had the ability to see the whole road and or minimum this intersection, you know, a lot of money and resources and effort went into the roundabout. They did a nice 3D rendering. They did a lot of work. They held a workshop. They mailed over 5,000 people and invited them to a workshop. All this money went into the roundabout to promote it. They built models on long tables. Why? Because they believed in it. That's, that's why I believe they did it, because they thought it was the best thing, and I applaud them. And so as we are now falling back on a traditional intersection for all the reasons, a, the, the question is, can similar investment be made to ensure the citizens see what they're going to get? Um, I don't, I don't think FDOT, I, I will ask, and, and I just want to talk through it in the public and the sunshine here and say, what do we think about that? Is asking FDOT as nice as we can? And when they hear this recording, if they listen to this, I'm asking now, can we see a 3D rendering as soon as possible? Because I think the citizens will, will learn a lot from that and get excited, even if it's just for a strip of land. Uh, for this particular case. Um, what do y'all think about that? Or at least an aerial design to know what we're getting. The worst they can say is no. Exactly. Aerial design would be good. Yeah. You, Just the aerial view would be sufficient mm -hmm. for me. <clears throat> and any of us can ask for whatever we want at any time, and so can the public. I'm just trying to use this opportunity to think Tapping onto the list, we've got one question, how far back the stop signs go. We got another question on, can we get an aerial design? I'll just say, is a 3D rendering too much to ask? I mean, um, we can talk with, with Todd and see, and Legs and the team. I would okay. like to see on both, because we were talking about the stop signs and different things, if they could do it on both, one and two. The, yeah. Agreed. Um, the, the aerial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they might just go, well, that was two, and then remove it and say it's one, but yes, agreed. Okay, yes. Um, can we also ask for a another crosswalk at Columbia, a lighted crossroad or a light there? I agree with uh, Mr. Abreu. Abreu that, you know, Thurm is really close to the one at Central. So uh, a crosswalk at Columbia would be... Plus they have the ice cream and the, and the ice kids cream are trying to cross. There. Everybody's crossing to get to the ice cream. Mayor, I yes, just want yes. to clarify um, Mr. Brew's comment, I thought was a signalized intersection at Columbia or are you saying just a crosswalk? A, sig a full signalized. signalized intersection is what he's requesting. Right, or a, or a Right. So um, just FYI, um, they have to do a warrant analysis before they put in a signal, and that has to do with the turning movements and going bi-directionally. There has to be enough traffic going both ways to warrant that. There's a certain number they want to hit. And my recollection was that they could hit it or they thought they could hit it with Therm. So they would have to do the same signal warrant analysis for Columbia that triggers a whole study by itself. But what we can do is request they do a signal warrant analysis on Columbia. Okay. okay. And that would be the so, push the button and red light. Yeah. A signal analysis, Columbia? A, a signal warrant analysis at okay. Columbia. And that's, that to Mayor Pro Tem Kellum's point, that would also include a push button crosswalk. Right. But also for when cars pull up on Columbia, they wait, it's red, it turns green, they get to turn. 
full signal. Okay. Yes. So there was some public comments earlier, I think. I wanted to come back to that. Question. Okay. Online, I'm checking in. If anybody has any comment, I just want to do a brief pause and let you jump in here. Workshop, have you heard anything that you, you need to say? Something? Yes, please come up, Miss Michelle. add to something that was already said, just very small. Cape Canaveral Hospital is moving to Merritt Island. So we will not have a hospital here close to us any longer. Mm -hmm. And with the emergency facilities available to us having to go to Merritt Island, getting in and out of these streets, if we have to have separated medians and so forth, is going to make it very difficult for the emergency vehicles and it's going to add to the time that it's going to take for us to get to that emergency facility. And this is a very important issue for those of us that are senior citizens and have issues of health that are terminal. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? In? Yes, please come up. We're just trying to keep it at a minute. You can. Thank you. Hello. Nancy Tillman, I didn't know if I should speak because I'm Nancy. a new resident. No, I please. live on international. Welcome, tracks, so welcome. Yes. But, um, I'm from the Fort Lauderdale area, and that is U-Turn City. And it is not fun, all the U-Turns that you have to do in Fort Lauderdale to get anywhere. So I'm very strong proponent of one, because of not having to do so many U-Turns. And then also, I have started walking. So that was one of the things that drew me to this area, as you said, um, that it is walkable. And yes, I've tried to go to the, to the lights, but no, I've gone into the middle. I don't know if that's allowed, but um, you know, I, I you feel go. pretty safe. <laughs> don't follow me <laughs> um, but I was going to walk here and now I'm glad I didn't because I really would have not have liked to walk at night mm. having to cross these streets. So that's my two cents. Well, thank, thank you. you, Nancy, and welcome to the city of Cape Canaveral. We're getting right involved. Yes, Bruce. If you don't mind, there are people from home and, and if you would, if you speak just into the mic, the people from home can hear. Sarah just mentioned this to me, and I don't know whether this is within FDOT uh, or you or whether the city is responsible for it. And this lady just brought it up here. The lighting at night of these proposed sidewalks, bicycle paths, street paths. Who is responsible for that? Is it part of the FDOT plan or is the city going to be responsible for it? Because again, as this, this lady just brought up, walking mm -hmm. at night on these new sidewalks is going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. And so how these sidewalks are lit at night is going to be an issue. And I don't know who is responsible for that. That's all I wanted to say. Good question. Mayor, that's, that's FDOT's responsibility. They'll do um, an analysis of all of the area of the right of way that they have um, to make sure it meets certain minimum standards. Also, when it comes to lighting, we've talked, and this is a future discussion, obviously, we talked about perhaps um, enhanced lighting lighting not perhaps more low level lighting too would be helpful too so that that's definitely a great point and a, a lot more to talk about later on that well again as this progresses as we revise or approve again as the mayor said and as councilmember Cohen said we need and once we decide what once you decide what we're going to go with plan one or two and how we're going to modify it we really need the type of presentation, as the mayor said, that we received at the Radisson for the roundabout. A detailed 3D description, model, CGI of what we are going to get. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Good comments. Anything else out there? Okay, we're going to bring it back to the council. I do see a hand raised, uh, Miss Carol Munn. Your hand is raised. I'm going to assume you'd like to speak and I will unmute you. I 
a second here. All right, Carol, can you hear me? You are unmuted. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I've lived here since 98, so. <laughs> Uh, but this part doesn't really impact me because I live down on Buchanan, but I'm concerned about all the traffic like, south of this. And I'd like to see where does this terminate into the one lane, <laughs> you know, or the two lane, the four lane and the two, one, two lanes. Where does it do that? Here, okay. um, we'll, we'll address that question certainly. Do you have any more questions or was that it for now? No, you know, I I just think that there's a lot of hoo-ha going on on this one mile. And when the ships are all in here, you can't even get to 520, you know. So I'd like to see something projected more south through Cape Canaveral. You know, I mean, uh, the traffic on A1A south of this is going to be ludicrous. And I just see a bottleneck going from four lanes to two. So, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think it's beautiful in the whole thing, but, you know, uh, and I think they're just dying to get rid of this money. <laughs> it's like, but, you know, I, I mean, and you were talking five years from now, um, mm -hmm. things change, you know, and I mean, is there any, thing in the you know working of getting some kind of overpass into you know for people from the port to go down to the pier or something you know i mean the traffic when you know five ships are in here is nuts <laughs> anyway yeah. and you know and thank you very much um we're going to go ahead and address your question there and okay. uh, i'm going to go ahead and uh, make sure to know you're muted here, but the, um, Todd, do you want to take that? Yes, um, just to dispel um, maybe some misunderstanding. This is a four lane section throughout Cape Canaveral and there's no talk of changing it from a four lane section. There is discussion about the two way left turn lane in the middle turning into a median, but nowhere are we talking about four lanes being reduced to two lanes. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm online. I think that is all the the hands I see raised. Okay, back here, uh, council. We have um, heard some great comments from the, the public. Thank you all. Um, the list that I have is how far back stop signs are from A1A an aerial design for both, um, alternative one and two, 3D rendering ideally for the one, you know, I, I know these things take time. I would say for at least alternative ones, if that's the one we want, if it's alternative two, we can say we would request uh, a design for that. Both would be wonderful, but so both is, uh, we are asking for that if possible. And uh, the signal warrant analysis, right, for uh, yeah. Columbia. What else? Anything else we would like to, I think you can see those things. We're gonna have a, a much better picture. Um, Todd, do you have anything that you, Lexi, that you're hearing out of us or that maybe you can? Yeah, I, I think um, getting back to the, the point of the workshop tonight is a goal, uh, an outcome of this would be to make a decision on the width from curb to curb. Uh, and that's being established here in this project. Uh, and it will, anything we do to the north and anything we do to the south. So while I, I agree with Mr. Abreu, for example, about the signal warrant analysis, I don't think it has any bearing on the decision that's in front of us today. It's a great point, but it's for the next phase. So if we could limit our comments at this point to what's going to help us make a decision between one and two, um, that will help us move forward as expeditiously as possible. So I think what I'm hearing, and Lexi, you can, can compare this to your notes, 
is we want to see additional graphics, overviews, aerials of both option one and two to see how they not only apply to this intersection, but let's go a little bit north too and see some typical stop signs about how they might interact with um, options one and two, say with the nine foot sidewalk or the separated cycle track and, and, and sidewalk. Those additional graphics will help us make the decision that they're asking us to make. And I know we're asking for both. I think we have one of the two. And I think it's option number two. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do one of those. If it's just a one. matter of removing it, that's going to be great. And if that can be um, distributed, um, I don't know if we have a place on the website where we're kind of, this is one of our projects, but to put up the latest um, in this council, we can work and even get it out there. And my hope was that when we meet again, which sounds like a December, we would have. We will have something that we can review at that meeting that may not be reasonable but but an aerial at least and i think some of these questions they'll have no problem answering so mayor how about we um we tentatively target a, an informational response item to, for the december council meeting provided we have some something to respond well we'll respond either way it could be yes we got something and here it is or no we didn't hear anything for that for the December uh, 6th meeting or 6th or 20th 6th okay does that sound okay council mm -hmm. city attorney any comments uh Todd good no Lexi you've got Lexi? all those notes okay okay um public here workshop any final statements yes Thank y'all. Thank you all very much for being here. And Georgiana, thank you again for being here. Um, I don't see any hands raised at home. And with that, I want to just say briefly here, Council Member Willis approached me. Do you want a little bit of time here? We can, we, we'll, we'll actually, let's go ahead and do something with this first. I'm sorry, I led you. I set you up for failure there. Um, that's bad. I'm sorry. Do you need a motion or do you have consent? Do you have clear direction? I have my list. Um, it, I, I would ask for consensus if council agrees that that's the direction they want staff to take this. Consensus? We'll record Anyone consensus. Anyone oppose? No one? Good. You have consensus. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Council Member Willis. Uh, yes. Last um, Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization um, Executive Committee voted on the uh, Space Coast TPO organization's uh, resiliency master plan and executive summaries. And it works well hand in glove with uh, uh, Cape Canaveral's resiliency plan. And I wanted to share that with council. And uh, if there's any way we can put that up on our website where the public can access it as well, it goes into a lot of very good detail on storm surge, sea level rise, flood resiliency, shoreline erosion, wow. fire resiliency, all for Brevard County, but Cape Canaveral is at the top of the list because we're first see, in the alphabet. So I wanted, <laughs> I wanted the council to have a copy of it so that they Thank could you. Uh, uh, study it. It's very useful information. The public should have access to it because this will help us in how we plan and how we respond and how Brevard County and the TPO responds to any emergencies we have. So I've got a copy for everybody. And that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other? Yeah, one, one other thing. I wanna thank Lexi Miller and Zach as well for binding this for me and printing it out in color for me because like you, Mr. Mayor, I can't work the printer upstairs. <laughs> Are there any other reports? Council Member Davis, any reports from you? Mayor Pro Tem? Well, I just want to say um, November 11th is Veterans Day, and there'll be a, um, a ceremony at Veterans Park. Um, I believe it starts at 11 11. Thank you. Okay. 
Any final comments? Seeing none. Meeting adjourned. Oh my gosh, I know.